So Dr. Bryson's asked me to come this semester to talk about really old drama and really old poetry, two things that no one pretty much actually reads anymore. So I've, I'm hoping that uh, through s our discussions from last time as well as today that um, even if it may not be our, our preference for what we read, that we gain a little bit more respect for it and see the value that has lasted for 400 years and why it's, it's still so relevant for us today if we're just willing to, to look at it. John Donne is one of my favorite poets, maybe, maybe my, act, my actual favorite poet, if not he's probably in the top three. And the reason why is because um, he lived a very interesting and conflicted life, which I'll talk briefly about. Um, you know, like Shakespeare, he lived in, a, in, a, in an interesting time for creativity and um, interesting social movements. But he also, I think, reflects the mind of a lot of people and especially, I would assume, a lot of us. That's why I tend to gravitate toward John Donne's poems is because I feel a little bit of myself when I read his work. And I'm hoping, or I'm, I'm curious to see as you read, if you see some of yourselves in it as well, because I sat in your seats a long time ago. It's actually exactly 20 years now since I was your age and I sat in classrooms just like this and I read texts like you're reading and, um, you know, that was on my own Christian college campus back in Indiana, but I was in your, your shoes and like a lot of you probably, I was a Christian my whole life. You know, my parents are Christians, my family's all Christians, and so it was easy growing up in a Christian household um, because that was what I knew and that's what I believed and I never, never really doubted it. But as I got to college, even though I was at a Christian college um, and as already a Christian, that didn't mean I still, uh, that didn't mean I didn't have questions. Again, I don't know if I'd say doubts, I've never doubted my faith, but there's certainly things that the older I got and the more intelligent I got, the more I wondered about things, the more I was curious about things. Things didn't always seem as black and white as I had thought them to be. You know, when you're a kid and you grow up in the faith, you know, oh yeah, there's, there's salvation and creation and redemption and Jesus and all these great Bible characters, and we, we get the main message, and I believe it, and that's great. But sometimes as you get older and you face the world, it gets a little bit more confusing. And so you, you do ask those kinds of questions, and I know as a college student, that's when I asked the most questions. Even though I was a Christian at a Christian college, I found myself asking all sorts of tough questions, and maybe that's you. You know, what are we doing here? Why, why does this make any sense at all? Um, why did God make this in the first place? Why did he make it so hard? Why would he send his son to die for a nobody like me? All of those questions are valid ones that I know I thought about and perhaps you've thought about them too. And those are the kinds of questions that I think John Donne wrestles with and why he's so relatable from a human perspective. You're in a humanities class to study what it's like to be a human. And we saw Shakespeare write about what it's like in a fictional way to create personality and to re reflect real world humans. But John Donne is a real world human. He is a devout Christian. And yet he really struggles in a number of ways with what his faith actually means. And those are some of the things that show up in his poems that we're going to talk about today. Let me grab my clicker. So to get us started, I titled this, what are we talking about when we talk about poetry? Because uh, I understand it's not always people's first option when they are thinking about reading material, and many times it's quite difficult. Um, I don't think done is overly difficult. I think there are people who are more difficult, but, he, you know, it, it's not exactly easy to get through in places. So what I often do is I, I want to place a context of what poetry looked like for him in the scope of how poetry developed over time. And so I was just in the other Hume class a, a little while ago, and I was talking about some literature and worked backwards to see where we ended up. But for, for us to see where poetry really fits in, we need to see where it goes. And so really quickly, I think you'll be able to get a visual of what we're, what we're dealing with here and why poetry is the way it is during John Donne's time. So this is a sonnet by Shakespeare, contemporary of Donne. Many of Donne's poems look exactly like this. In fact, all of his sonnets look like this. 
We can tell that it's very symmetrical, it's structured. There's always 14 lines. There's always a particular rhyme scheme. And um, you know, almost always there's 10 syllables to a line. So everything is very, very precise. Poetry was exact, okay? But over time, when the rules started to open up a little bit, this is uh, in the Romantic era, still very structured, but now there's sort of this beginning, middle, and end. Uh, this is by John Keats. Eventually it morphs into the mid-1800s where Walt Whitman kind of gets rid of most of those rules and it becomes sounding like prose. There's really no difference. If you were to read this out loud, it would sound like normal prose writing, not poetry. And then all of that gets blown up by the time the modernists come around, which I was just talking about with, with the other class. Now poetry doesn't look like anything that John Donne would ever think of writing. So why is poetry the way it is for John Donne? Well, there's the history of poetry is important to know because poetry used to be the only respected literary art form. That's all, that's all there was. There was drama, but people didn't usually read drama. Poetry was it. Things like short stories, even novels, didn't exist. So when someone was talking about literature, what they were talking about was poetry. The reason why it was so respected and regarded as this elite art form up there, you know, probably not quite at the time of the Renaissance with, with painting or sculpting, but as a literary creation is because of its precision. People who were poets were thought to have mastered the craft of measuring out every single, not just line, not even just word, but every single syllable. And if you could get it just right and then have good meaning with it, well, you were a master. You were, you were a truly creative person and you were a poet. Obviously, that's changed over time. And so the thinking back then was, well, anything that's longer or anything that has, you know, they couldn't conceive of something having 300 pages, you know, a novel, and being artistic. They think, what are all those wasted words? Like, there's no way all of those words are important. And that's true. You can cut out portions of novels and it doesn't affect it at all. So they viewed poetry as the highest form of literary art because it had to be precise. So when we read poetry, especially during this time period, what we should be thinking is, this author has created this poem in a very specific way and for a very specific reason. Every single mark on the page has a purpose. Now, that's where it can get a little bit tedious if you're not used to doing it, and I know that's not always the most fun thing, but that's how I want you to think about John Donne's writing. We're going to spend a lot of time on message and, and some themes and techniques, um, but on your own time, when you go to read these pieces again, I want you to go very slowly and look at every single word because they're there for a reason. It's not a novel where I could say a whole bunch of things and it probably doesn't affect the plot. Everything a poet does when he's writing a sonnet like this matters. So I think you're going to watch a film over the next few days um, about a, an English professor who is facing her mortality. And in the film, she has discussions. She's a John Donne expert, and so she has discussions about Donne. And one of the poems that you'll see that they talk about in the film is this one of the most famous ones is Holy Sonnet 10. And the discussion that takes place in the film, so make sure you pay attention to it when you watch it, is the tiniest variations of the text. Actually, the text that's referred to in the film, I've never actually seen. It's a very obscure text, but these are the two most common. And as you give a glancing look at it, you probably don't notice any difference. But can you see anything that's slightly different between the one on the left and the one on the right? Corey, what do you see? Which line are you in? Sorry, first line. First line, okay. First one says death. Good. Good. Okay. <coughs> Teeny tiny comma, you think, who cares? It matters. I promise. Any other little changes? What about the last line, you see any difference? Death has capital letters. Death has capital letters in some places. So what does it mean when something's capitalized versus not capitalized? Does that change the meaning of the poem? Many would argue, yes, it does, all right? So that's the, I know that's getting very specific, but this is what we talk about when we talk about poetry. It's every word matters. 
even every symbol matters, whether it's a punctuation symbol or how a letter is written, it might change the meaning. So always look very, very closely. So be aware of, uh, of uh, Sonnet 10 when you watch that film. You may have heard John Donne's words before, before we dive into his actual poetry. You may have heard some of his words before. He's got a, a few famous lines that have lasted, the test, uh, lasted throughout the years. No man is an island. If you've heard that phrase, it's basically cliche now, but he's the one who wrote it first. Um, and also, never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Um, Ernest Hemingway's World War I book has the title, For Whom the Bell Tolls. So, um, you know, you may have heard some of these other pieces of language. We talked about that with Hamlet last time, how his, his words and phrases have dominated the English language. Dunn isn't quite like that, but you may have heard some of his language before. But actually a piece of writing that I actually enjoy almost as much as his poems is this short, uh, it's an excerpt from a sermon actually, uh, it's called Expostulation, Expostulation 19, very fun title. But notice what he says. It says, my God, thou art a direct God, but thou art also a figurative, metaphorical God too. Thou givest the same word for our satisfaction and for our inquisition, for our instruction and for our admiration. How often, how much more often, doth thy son call himself a way and a light and a gate and a vine and bread than the son of God or of man? How much oftener doth he exhibit a metaphorical Christ than a real, a literal, to make their accesses to thee in such a language, such a kind of language, as thou wast pleased to speak to them in a figurative, in a metaphorical language. We might often think of poetry, if you've read in high school or over the years, as, oh, it's just these poets, these writers trying to be fancy, using their their uh, clever language and trying to paint these pictures in our minds that why don't they just get to the point? Just tell us what you want us to know. That's sometimes a fair argument. But what Dunn definitely realizes is that well, it's not just people who try to get their message across using metaphorical, symbolic language. God does as well. And so if we're to understand what it means to be a human, if it, we're to understand what it means when messages are written down for us, we can't just live in a literal world. We have to know how metaphors and symbolism and figurative language actually work because that's how God speaks to us a lot of the time. We mentioned in Hamlet, remember what Hamlet says to Horatio, my favorite line, there's more to this world, Horatio, than what's found in your natural philosophies. And he meant sciences, right? There's more. It's not just facts. It's not just science that defines truth. There's other forms of truth. And in fact, sometimes those truths are more truth than the truth you think is truth. Let me give you a quick example. You know, um, just to follow up with, with Dunn's explanation of, of God and Christ here, we might think in terms of the facts of who Jesus was, we say, well, he was a man. He was born in Bethlehem. He had a dad named Joseph. Okay, those are all fair, those are truthful facts. Got it, all right. But when we hear Christ described as the lamb, yeah, it's metaphorical language. But in fact, knowing that he's the lamb is more useful to us than knowing what town he was born in. There's actually more truth for us in how we interact with the world and then how we learn to love Christ by using the metaphorical language. When we know that he's a sacrificial person, that he spilled his blood, that he died for all of us, so he's the capital L lamb, right? That's actually more meaningful to us than the factual details of his life sometimes. So when we speak in these metaphorical pieces of language, I know it can be frustrating. You're like, what is this person talking about? Why are they being so you know, off the wall creative? Perhaps the poet is trying to speak to you a truth that a fact, or a piece of scientific evidence just can't quite cover. Maybe the metaphor is more truthful than the real thing. So, you know, think of a chair, right? Yeah, I can label it as a chair. I can say it's made of metal and wood. Well, then it's also made of elements and molecules and atoms and whatever's lower than atoms. Those are all scientifically truthful facts. 
But that chair becomes a lot more important to me when I've been standing on my feet all day or I've been walking for miles and miles and I'm weary and I need a place to rest. Suddenly, talking about a chair in those terms is more important than calling it a chair made of wood and metal. So there's more to this world than just the facts. There's, there's other forms of truth, and I think that's what Dunn knew, and he explained it literally to us, but he also uses it in his poems, and so that's what we need to be looking for when we read his poetry. He does all this for the sake of truth, which is what I just said, and he viewed the, the pursuit of truth as not an easy path. He didn't believe that faith should come easy or that you should just accept everything or that it's some emotional reaction. Not that that's not possible, but he viewed faith as an intellectual exercise. He viewed it as a struggle up a hill. On a huge hill, cragged and steep, truth stands. And he that will reach her about must and about must go. And what the hill's suddenness resists, wind so, hard deeds, the body's pains, Hard knowledge too, the mind's endeavors reach. I would assume that in your other classes, and I know for sure in this class, and I know for sure in my classes, our job is to find truth, but truth is sometimes, it's difficult. Maybe it's supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be a mental struggle. Maybe our faith isn't supposed to be quite so easy. But if we want to find the truth, you've got to go through that process. And Dunn knows that as well as anybody, and we're going to see that in his, in his literature. So even though we're going to read fancy language and cool word pictures, ultimately we're always seeking the truth. So, who is this guy that has this view of the world and does what he does? Well, like I said, Dunn's a pretty interesting guy. And whenever you just search uh, him as a person and look for images, these are about the only two that come up. Um, I don't know exactly how accurate they are, but um, these seem to be the only two paintings that maybe survived of John Dunn. Um, and I use both of them because Dunn had sort of two different parts of his life that are quite obvious. Um, there's a, the younger version, he's sort of this dashing, cool, traveling man. Uh, and then there's the wiser, older, more sophisticated priest um, that produces a lot of the sonnets that we're going to read today. But Dunn was born into a Catholic household when Catholicism was illegal. Um, much of the history of England and Western Europe was a back and forth between is, Catholic legal, is Catholicism legal or is Protestant the official religion of, of uh, Western Europe or of England specifically. So he was born and was raised in a time in which Protestantism was the only faith. Now keeping in mind that this is all Christianity, but they're more specific than that. No, you cannot be of the Catholic faith. So, faith. so his father was Catholic. That proved to be rather difficult. And of course he grew up Catholic. His father passed away when he was only four. He had a brother who was imprisoned and died of the plague in prison. He had uh, other friends who were um, killed early and, and, and died uh, 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 or were sent to prison or were punished harshly. So he had a, a bit of a rough early life, but he was also rather intelligent. He went to school in various places and he became fairly well traveled in his younger years. But because of his Catholicism, you can go to some schools, but you can't technically, technically graduate from them. So, um, you know, he basically finished all his schooling without ever receiving a diploma because it wasn't allowed to be handed to people non-Protestant. He also went to law school for a time and similar situations happened. He wasn't officially licensed because he wasn't the right faith. But he, he uh, like I said, he traveled a lot for his schooling and, and spent a lot of time in various points in Western Europe and was a bit of a wild man by all accounts. Uh, he liked the ladies, he liked uh, having a good time, uh, he definitely had a, a free spirit. Um, but once he turned about 25 and he came back to England, he started to change his life a little bit. Um, he decided to move away from his Catholicism, he, he accepted the Protestant um, uh, faith that was dominating England, um, which led to a few more opportunities for him, but he had felt discrimination for uh, in many ways, in many of his job opportunities. So um, he has his personal struggles that he's going through. He also then, when he's about 29, he marries his, uh, his wife, of course, uh, his only wife. But she dies at age 33, even though he lives to almost 60. And they have 12 children. But along the way, he sees 
Two of them are two of them are stillborn, so they don't even make it. Three of them die before the age of ten, and another girl dies before she's eighteen. So he actually watches six of his own children out of the twelve die as long, along with his wife, who dies at thirty-three. So this is a guy who's faced some tragedy and hardship in his life, and yet he, um, you know, he still stays with the faith. But we can see on the page how those struggles kind of overwhelm him at times. But Dunn is a very interesting guy uh, with an interesting life story, eventually becoming um, a very successful preacher. Uh, he becomes the priest of a main cathedral and um, you know, s publishes hundreds of sermons. And you know, we're only getting some of the most famous of his writings. He, he was a, quite a prolific writer of not only poetry, but other forms of essays and sermons as well. So um, we see on the right the more distinguished uh, uh, kind of elder figure that John Donne eventually became, but he was not always that way. One of his poems that seems to reflect his youth a little bit more is a famous one you may have uh, uh, read in high school. Well, I don't know if you read it in high school, but it's in other textbooks. It's called The Flea, and it's essentially about a guy trying to convince a girl to sleep with him. It's a very, very crafty little poem here. Uh, and the three stanzas, he essentially um, uses a bug to make a parallel that, uh, you know, if this bug bites both of us and it has both of our blood in the bug as it walks around creeping on the floor, um, you know, it has our, li our, our lives and our blood mixed together. That's actually more serious than if the two of us were to hook up. After all, we're not, we're not mixing blood. We're not mixing our whole lives together. We're just going to enjoy ourselves for a little while. And by the end, when the young lady squashes the bug and um, you know, essentially he says, well, you've killed three things. You killed the bug, you've killed me, and you've killed you because we were inside that bug. Look at, look at the things you've done. What we're about to do, it's not as big a deal as that, so don't worry about it. So as a younger man, we, we don't know exactly the publication date of this, but we can assume this was probably written in his younger years um, before he eventually writes uh, sort of different types of poems um, once he gets married especially. But he doesn't necessarily lose some of his erotic imagery. If you read some of his other poems, um, he discusses those things quite often, perhaps not as explicitly as this, but uh, it's an interesting contrast between the poems we're going to read today and this one that's also quite famous. So he's often categorized as a metaphysical poet, and that was actually considered sort of a derogatory, uh, a derogatory label on the group of poets that were writing it about this time. That label actually came much later when scholars were studying these poets, and they didn't really like them. It's kind of interesting that someone like Dunn, who was amazingly articulate um, and incredibly creative, who was crafting a sort of a new way of poetry, um, their style was really discredited for quite a while, which is, which is interesting. But it was called metaphysical poetry, and it's essentially when these authors take simple things and elevate them to this eternal level. And on the flip side, you can take eternal things, big concepts like God and eternity, and bring them down to the physical level, to the almost common, mundane level. And so it's providing these contrasts between the simple and the everyday and these giant concepts like God that really threw off some readers, and they didn't necessarily appreciate, or, uh, appreciate that technique at the time. And so they were, they were criticized for, for a while. Essentially, those, these, these poems ask these big questions. Well, what is there? What is life like? What do we do? What does all this mean? Which is what all good literature should do anyway, but they, they're pretty explicit about it. So one thing that Dunn does a lot, in addition to his other figurative language and other writing techniques, is he uses conceits. Conceits is a fancy word for an extended metaphor, where you, you draw a parallel to something simple and you, you make big, broad claims about it. So one of his most famous we see those in his sonnets, so I'll talk about a few of those. But well, one of his most famous is called um, a, a Valediction, Forbidden Morning, which is about his wife and his love for his wife. And he um, compares his love for his wife with a compass. Remember a compass from high school drafting classes or any math class, right? And drawing circles and measuring things with it. And we think, why would we compare our devotion to our wife and our love to something so simple and uninteresting. Well, that's what Valediction Forbidden Morning is about. The first half of the poem is explaining that he's about to go on a trip. He's going to leave for a while. 
he's got to go travel. But the back half of the poem draws this conceit. So when you hear conceit, that's what it's a, it's a metaphor, it's a comparison. So he said, though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion like gold to an airy thinness beat. Gold's kind of amazing because you can take gold. It's so pure and strong that you can take a piece of gold and stretch it for, you can take an ounce of it. So a teeny tiny bit, an ounce, and stretch it for 50 miles and it still retains the property of gold, all right? So he's saying, we're gonna be at a great distance, but like gold that can be stretched, our love can be stretched that far. We're not gonna break. We're gonna be strong enough to withstand it. If they be two, they are two so, as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, thy fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. So just like a compass where the one of them stays in the middle of the circle while the other travels, right? They're still together even though they're separated. And though it is in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it, and grows erect as that comes home. So again, as the, as the foot travels and it grows farther apart, that center point leans towards it. Like it's still, it's still part of it. And when that center point, or when the, the traveling part comes closer, it stands taller and they get nearer together. Such wilt thou be to me who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Thy firmness makes thy circle just and makes me end where I begun. So, taking something as personal and as powerful as his love for his wife and comparing it to something so basic and boring, it seems like it shouldn't work. And yet, it paints such a beautiful picture for us that it's like, yeah, that's, that makes total sense. That's how it should be. We are like that when we're in love. So Samuel Johnson, who was a, a famous literary critic and did a lot of other philosophical writings, he hated this. He thought, you're taking these things that are not even supposed to be mentioned at the same time and you're comparing them. You're basically just trying to show off how smart you are. You're taking things that don't make any sense and you're claiming that you're really brilliant because you can make a comparison between the two. So he didn't like it and he didn't like the metaphysical poets and uh, when I leave these notes, you can read his extended commentary there. But uh, that's essentially what it was. They, they didn't like it very much. But time has shown that well, it kind of works, and it's really, really good. So let's start looking at, uh, at some of his poems. So we'll start with this one because I think it's fairly simple. But most of these, um, it might be hard to find the actual number. In my text, it's Sonnet 12. But I know in different editions, they get moved around a bit. But it starts with, why are, we all, uh, why are we by all creatures waited on? And I love this poem because it instantly makes me think of when I was a kid, my grandfather was a rancher in Montana. That's where my family's originally from. And so you had cattle and horses and all this. And I'd go up sometimes in the summers and I'd be just a little boy and I'd help him. We'd be out riding and we'd be doing work on the farm or on the ranch. And, and it was always funny that here I was, this little, you know, seven or eight year old boy. And, you know, I could control this gigantic beast beneath me, this horse. And I could get off the horse and I could walk up to, you know, thousand pound cattle and like move over there you know and they don't do anything they just kind of go where you want them to go and it's amazing that a, you know a, a, a tiny little boy could have power over these gigantic beasts and that they don't you know trample me in an instant and that's sort of where Dunn comes at uh, at this piece where he thinks about about the other creatures of earth and thinks about our connection to them he says why are we by all creatures waited on why do the prodigal elements supply life and food to me, being more pure than I, simple and further from corruption. So we humans have been created to be superior to these animals, even though they're bigger than we are and more powerful, and they're more innocent. We're corrupted, we're sinful, we have problems, and yet we're, we're placed above them. God cares more about us than these actual innocent animals. Why brokest thou, ignorant horse, subjection? Why dost thou bull and bore so sillily, sillily, dissemble weakness, and by one man's stroke die? Again, these animals are huge, and yet we have control over them. It's kind of amazing. Whose whole kind you might swallow and feed upon. Weaker I am. Woe is me, and worse than you. You haven't sinned, nor need be timorous, fearful. Animals are innocent. We're not. But wonder, at a great wonder, 
For to us created nature doth these things subdue, but their creator whom sin nor nature tied, for us his creatures and his foes hath died. God chose to die, sent his son to die, for we sinful, pathetic animals when he really didn't have any need to. He's the creator. He could do whatever he wants. And yet he made us vulnerable and broken and sinful and still did this for us, even though there's other animals in our world that are much more innocent than we are. He even calls us his creatures, his foes. An interesting final use of, word, uh, of describing us there that sometimes we actually are in conflict with him. Whereas these animals... They're never in conflict with him. God, God created them. He loves them. We're the ones who fight against him, and yet he still died for us. So that's one of his more, I think, easier ones to grasp. Um, but let's keep going with a couple more. And one thing, as you'll notice as I read most of these out loud, poetry becomes much more helpful to you when you read out loud. So I know it might be a little embarrassing, or you might need to do it in the quiet of your dorm room, or just... Whisper to yourself when you're at lunch reading or whatever you do, but try your best to read out loud. You'll, you'll hear the rhythms better and it'll make more sense to you. So um, poetry needs to be read in a slightly different way than you read other things. So the first poem we just read, notice how it starts. It starts with a question. Well, he does that a number of times and these are two of the ones I like the best. Starting with a question so we can see how he works through the thought process. Again, these are intellectual exercises. So he starts with a problem in his brain that he can't quite figure out. And through each line, it seems like he tries to come to a conclusion about it. So this one he starts, Thou, God, God hast made me, and shall thy work decay? Repair me now, for, for now mine end doth haste. It's an interesting question. This is God, creator of all, the universe. He made me but he made me that I'm actually falling apart every single day. We're decaying. He could have created us to live eternally and be beautiful and perfect, but he didn't. He made us things that actually are starting to rot. So the question is, well, why would you do that? He says, I run to death, and death meets me at fast. We're in this unavoidable collision course with death. We can't avoid it. We're headed towards it. It's coming towards us. It's going to happen. And all my pleasures are like yesterday. The good things I remember, they're in the past. I dare not move my dim eyes any way. Despair behind and death before doth cast. Such terror and my feeble flesh doth waste by sin in it, which it towards hell doth weigh. Sometimes I feel like a little kid lying in the dark, right? Where you, you, know, you lay there, you think you hear something. Maybe there's a monster in your imagination and you lay there with just your eyes open and you're frozen. You don't move because you don't know what's going to happen. Again, he knows that physical death is coming, but he also fears a spiritual death that maybe, like reminiscent of Hamlet, what's beyond might actually be worse than what this is. Only thou art above, and when towards thee by thy leave I can look, and I rise again. But our old subtle foe so tempt tempteth me. I like the word our there, that he, he puts God and man together when we're fighting evil and sin, that we're, we're in this together. That not one hour myself I can sustain. I have to have God's strength to survive. I'm not going to make it without it. Thy grace may wing me to prevent his art, and thou like adamant draw mine iron heart. Those two lines are great. I love the, I talked about this with Hamlet, where sometimes Shakespeare uses words that aren't meant to be used that way. The word wing, I mean, that's, that's a noun, right? It's a thing. And he uses it as a verb, and it makes our brain go, ooh, pay more attention to that. That's interesting. And then we get the conclusion, adamant. Adamant's like a, a giant stone, like a diamond, and it has the power to, like a magnet, draw things closer to it. And so he, you know, he's using God like a, 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 a giant magnet that needs to draw me closer if I'm going to survive this. I need God's closeness for protection. So again, why would an all-loving, powerful God create things that break down and die? Why does he punish us with that kind of pain? But he always gives us the method by which to get through it as if he brings the disease but also the medicine. God's the eternal question but also the eternal answer. You're going to see that. I'll talk about paradox here in a second, but 
It shows up in the film you're going to watch where she's going through cancer treatment and actually she was healthier before the cancer treatment actually makes her sicker and she's like, what am I doing? The medicine is what's killing me. So we're the same way in our own lives. But starting with questions and you can really watch Dunn's pro uh, mental process as he goes through line by line. He also uses some other comparisons. So remember, Dunn has a bit of a legal background. He went to law school for a while and so some of his poems have this financial and legal terminology uh, interwoven in it. So I've, I've actually highlighted them for you so it's nice and easy to see, but notice uh, how many of these show up in his, in his poem. This is number 16 uh, in my edition. Father, part of his double interest, and we know double interest means if you're interested in something, you, you care about it, you look after it, but interest also you know, has the idea that there's, uh, there's a payment coming at a later date, right? When you have interest, you, you pay extra. Part of his double interest unto thy kingdom, son, thy son gives to me his jointure in the naughty trinity. A jointure was a property held by, uh, held by um, one spouse and then it was given to the other. So it's like a contract. He keeps and gives to me his death's conquest. This lamb whose death with life the world hath blessed was from the world's beginning slain and he hath made two wills, capital Oh, my edition has a capital W. Wills, which, which with the legacy of his and thy kingdom do thy sons invest. Look at all those legal terms. Will, legacy, invest. And notice how these are all gifts too. These are things God, or that Christ um, is the form of that gift. And we, pay, we get the benefits from it. We get the investment. Yet such are thy laws that men argue yet whether a man those statutes laws, statutes, other rules, other legal terms, can fulfill. A lot of people doubt Christ's divinity or his, his power of salvation, and we don't always deserve those kinds of gifts. And so there's um, these arguments that come up, like he says, and we wonder, can, can he even hold up on these promises? None doth, but all healing grace and spirit revive again what law and letter kill. My sins are written down, but the intent of the will, the gift that Christ has given, we're, is going to supersede that. Thy law's abridgment and thy last command is all but love. Oh, let this last will stand. So again, there's this promise of heaven, like, like a contract, like a will that's left, this gift that's given to us, and we're the inheritors of the, of the gift. And, you know, again, it's, sometimes it's, uh, he's using this, uh, this figurative language because sometimes we go, wait a minute, a guy died on a cross for these sins I'm supposed to have and now I'm forgiven and I get to go to heaven. What does that even mean? But when you compare it to like a contract or an investment that earns interest over time because it's a gift given to you and you're going to uh, obtain the final profit from it, oh, okay, that makes a little more sense now. So these, uh, these metaphors are, are important. This one's about the church. So if you're a theology person, pay attention to this one. This is, uh, in my version, number 18. Show me, dear Christ, thy spouse so bright and clear. What is it she which on the other shore goes richly painted, or which robbed and tore laments and mourns in Germany and here? So this is a reference to Catholics as well as Protestants, placing them in different locations. Sleeps she a thousand, then peeps up one year. Is she self-truth and heirs, now new, now out war? Does she and did she and ever sh and shall she ever more on one, on seven, or on no hill appear? She's talking about the various headquarters of these faiths. Dwells she with us, or like adventuring knights, first travel we seek, we to seek, and then make love, betray, kind husband, thy spouse, to our sights, and let mine amorous soul court thy mild dove, dove, Holy Spirit, who is true and, ple and pleasing to them then, when she is embraced and open to most men. The last two lines are quite interesting. Pleasing to thee then when she is embraced and open to most men. I told you there's still a little bit of his erotic language that seeps into his other uh, poems. He's essentially saying, we've been closed off. We, we, we sects of churches have been kind of arguing with each other and keeping each other separate. But just think, if the church were more open promiscuous in another way of saying it. If we accepted more people, our faith would actually grow. We think that, our, that right now our faith needs to be divided. 
He's actually calling, maybe if we stopped fighting with each other and we all agreed that we know who Christ is and we believe the same thing, we'd actually grow in our faithfulness and we'd be a stronger church. Probably similar to what you've read about Paul in various places, right? So he's pleading with the churches, the bride, right, of Christ, to have more open, be more open to the love of God and acceptance of others, especially in the 17th century when they were continuously fighting. So again, you can see these different parallels he's drawing, right? The bride, there's legal terms, he's talking about animals, he's comparing all sorts of things, right? But he also uses these paradox, where you basically take two things that are contradictory, they're opposites, and you make them go together. And again, the, the critics didn't, use, didn't used to like this, they're like, oh, you're just trying too hard to sound smart. But we're going to look at some examples that prove that these are, these are pretty useful. And again, I mentioned the idea of the treatment imperils my health. You'll hear that quote in, that, in the film you're going to watch. So let's look at my favorite one that, that displays this. This is uh, Sonnet 14. This is one that gets published quite often, so you might have seen this even in other textbooks. But notice the violence. <laughs> this is a poem about salvation. It's a poem about asking God into your heart. And yet, look at the violent terminology. It's great. Batter my heart three-personed God, for you as, but, as yet, but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, overthrow me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. Like, I'm so lost that I need to kind of be destroyed in order to be remade new again. I, like a usurped town, to another do. Someone else has control of me. Labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. I'm trying, but I can't escape this thing that holds so much power over me. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Betrothed, I'm, I'm like I'm married, I'm wed to my sin, to, you know, evil, to Satan, to whatever it is that's controlling me. Divorce me, untie me, break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you, enthrall me, never shall be, th shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. Again, sort of that erotic terminology, but look at the power of those words that he's feeling so desperate, so lost, so separated from God that he believe he's making the comparison that the only way I can be saved is if you forcefully take me over. Like, I'm seeking you, but I can't reach you. Please come get me and capture my life again. So notice all the violent imagery. We don't usually think of words like batter and break and usurped and, you know, these pretty aggressive words for a loving God. But maybe that's the only way he can make us understand what he's feeling is by using that violent imagery. So pretty powerful stuff. So again, let's notice the paradoxes that come up in some of these, that here are opposite things that shouldn't go together, but that's how the point is made. Oh, to vex me. Again, paradoxes. Oh, to vex me, contraries meet in one. Inconstancy unnaturally hath begot a constant habit. Sort of the only thing constant is change, right? You ever heard that cliche? Oftentimes our habits form from being disorganized. We think, they go, we think it's the other way around, but it's not. That when I would not, I change in vows and in devotion, as humorous in my contrition, as my profane love, and as soon forgot, as riddlingly distempered, chaotic, cold and hot, as praying, as mute, as infinite, as none. He's all over the place, right? He's, he's trying to believe all these different things, and he can't quite bring it together. I durst not view yet heaven yesterday, and today in prayers and flattering speeches I court God, Tomorrow I quake with true fears of his rod. Every day is different. There's chaos in his life. Yesterday, I wasn't even thinking about heaven. Oh, but today, now I'm deep in prayer. Like, he can't, he can't be consistent in his own faith. Might sound similar to some of us sometimes. So my devout fits come and go away like a fantastic ague, which is an illness. Save that here, those are my best days. Here's the paradox when I shake with fear. So for him, the days where he's most clear in his faith 
where he's like, okay, I get it. I know that I need God today is actually when he's fearful. He calls those his best days. He's like, when I can fully recognize my sinful nature, <laughs> usually those are our worst days, right? When we're at our lowest point, we feel guilt, we feel sadness, we feel all these things that are not positive. And yet he's reached the conclusion that, no, those are actually the days when I'm more aware of myself and I know that I'm actually fearing God and connecting to God. It's a hard, it's a hard paradox to wrap your brain around. And um, again, I know that's not a very comfortable feeling for most of us, but for John Dunn, that seemed to be something he believed in quite regularly. Many titles I resign. For me, this is number two. Notice all the different metaphors here. So there's still paradoxes throughout and ironies and all that stuff, but notice some of his other figurative language. As do by many titles I resign myself to thee, O God. First I was made by thee and for thee. And when I was decayed, when I was sinning, thy blood bought that, the which before was thine. Notice all the comparisons. I am thy son, made with thyself to shine, and thy servant, whose pains thou still hast repaid, thy sheep, thine image, and till I betrayed myself a temple of thy spirit divine. We're all these things in relationship to God, right? Why doth the devil then usurp me? There's that word, that taking over. Why doth he steal, nay ravish, that's thy right? So Satan's trying to damage what is God's. Right? He's trying to steal us away from him. Except thou rise and for thine own work fight, but you fight back on my behalf. Oh, I shall soon despair when I do see that thou lovest mankind well, yet wilt not choose me. And Satan hates me, yet is loath to lose me. So think of the ironic twist here. God loves us, right? But he might not accept us if we don't get right with him. Satan hates us. He's trying to destroy us. And yet he's constantly trying to come and be with me. That's the kind of the, you can, you can just imagine that in a physical sense. That Can you imagine someone who hates you yet always wants to be around you? And someone who loves you might not be with you if, because you're not prepared for that. It's a tough thing to swallow, and I think that's a, just a profound way to, to conclude that poem. But look at all those other metaphors and how we fit into uh, our relationship with God. Just a couple more. Oh, my black soul. <laughs> These are, these are things Dr. Bryson was talking about where they're not always the most uh, heartening things to think about. Oh, my black soul. So he's talking to his soul. So there's a personification happening here. So another figurative language device, right? Now art thou summoned by sickness, death's herald and champion. Notice all these similes that show up. Thou art like a pilgrim, which abroad hath done treason and durst not turn to whence he is fled. When we become sinful, we can't turn back. We're, we've, we've crossed the border, right? We're in that world now. You, you can't become innocent again, right? Or like a thief, another simile, which till death's doom be read, wisheth himself delivered from prison, but damned and hailed to execution, wisheth that he still might be imprisoned. So again, the idea that, you know, uh, I might be miserable when I'm in prison, but the thought of being executed then makes prison seem not so bad. But there's this turn, and this often happens, that's why I've bolded right there, this turn that happens with six lines to go. This is pretty common in, in uh, sonnets. Yet grace, if thou repent, thou canst not lack. But who shall give thee that uh, grace to begin? O oh, make thyself with holy morning black and red with blushing as thou art with sin. We may be covered in red sin, but red blood is the thing that purifies us. Or wash thee in Christ's blood, which hath this might, that being red, it dyes red souls to white. And we can tell by the end that the word dyes is about color, but we also know in our faith that Christ dying for us fits that line perfectly as well. So while we run and we hide from sin, like we're a pilgrim, a traveler trying to escape, we eventually have to face it and we have to be cleansed. And we must act, even though God completes it, we have to take that first step. 
If you, Ephesians 2 uh, references some of this. And God shows faithfulness when we confess and we can't be forgiven otherwise. Check the beginning of 1 John where he talks about um, purifying us that way. So lots of biblical parallels here too. Last one. This is also a very famous one. This shows up in a lot of uh, just standard textbooks that are you know, not Christian based. I mean, I, this was in my high school textbook, so I remember it from back then. The round earth's imagined corners, blow your trumpets, angels, and arise, arise from death, you numberless infinities of souls, and to your scattered bodies go. So he's calling for judgment day. Angels, let's do it. And all whom the flood did and fire shall overthrow, all whom war, dearth, age, agues, illness, tyrannies, despair, law, chance, hath slain. And you whose eyes shall behold God and never taste death's woe. So essentially calling for the dead to wake up and prepare for God's judgment. Not just sinful people, but all people. Even those that aren't dead yet, we're all, we're all going to have to prepare ourselves. And again, here's this turn, this one final switch. But now he's talking to God. Angels first, now God. But let them sleep, Lord, and me mourn a space, for if above all these my sins abound, tis late to ask abundance of thy grace. He's worried that his own sins might be worse than those of the, of the dead he's talking about, and so he needs a little more time to repent. When we are there, here on this lowly ground, teach me how to repent, for that's as good as thou hadst sealed my pardon with thy blood. So there's the one final paradox for us that the thing God wants from us is something that we actually often don't know how to do. But God simultaneously makes forgiveness and salvation very easy. It's not so hard to repent. But sometimes it is very hard to repent. So it's, that's the contrast for us. So what do we take away from all this? Well, I think this is important. All literature is like this, even poetry. That we study these texts not just for the text's sake, right? but because it's about people and our relationship to the world. Yes, these stories, these poems, these plays, these things we read, these philosophical texts, yeah, they've lasted a long time, but it's not about the words on the page. There's more to it than that because those words on the page are there to give us guidance on how we are supposed to interact with this world. The world is a place for action and doing things. It's not just a place for sitting and reading and not doing anything about it. That's what literature is for. So, it's about people. In our context for these poems and at this school, obviously these go even one step further, to develop our understanding about God. So when we read these texts, even though poetry may not be the most enjoyable thing for us sometimes, when we read these plays that have all this old language that's really hard for us to read, keep in mind that it's not just about those old words. It's not about old characters or these famous authors. It's about giving us Maybe not a road map, but at least some signage along the way for, hey, these are things people have struggled with. Maybe you can learn from them. Maybe you can apply these ideas to your own life. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 6 starts a passage about how sometimes messages are confusing because we spend so much time focusing on the words. But in that passage, Paul writes about how there's, the Spirit is working through those words. And sometimes we're so focused on the language that we're not opening ourselves up to God working through the language. So that's, I think, a good piece of advice that ties into any piece of difficult reading that you're supposed to be doing is don't stop just at the, the language. Don't stop because the ideas are hard. Be open to letting God speak through those ideas and through those words because that's the whole point, right? It's for us to learn about God and about how to live in this world. Lastly, in the film that you're I think going to watch the conversation about Holy Sonnet number 10 that Vivian, the, the student, has with her professor. It's about looking more closely at the text and trying to extract the ultimate amount of meaning from it. And in fact, this is what she says. The professor says, the effort must be total for the results to be meaningful. Total. Because Vivian is a very smart young lady in her college classroom. She thinks she has the answers, but in fact, her professor points out that you've actually just taken a shortcut. You haven't looked closely enough. And because you haven't looked closely enough, you haven't gotten what this is actually about. 
And I think that's good for a good lesson for studying difficult things like poetry, is it takes you looking closer. It means your effort has to be total, not just a little bit, oh, I read it because my teacher said, or, well, I feel good today, so I'll do some work. No, no, it's total. If you're going to extract meaning out of anything, it has to be total. So it's not just about literature, though. It's not just about reading hard plays like Hamlet or hard poems like Dunn's, but about everything we do. It's amazing the research that's out there now. We're starting to get statistics on this, about how young people, especially today, are at a complete loss of meaning. Like it's, th There's actually studies about this, that young people are increasingly finding themselves going, what does all this mean? What's the point of all this? And I'm not saying there's ultimate meaning found in every single piece of poetry, every single piece of literature, but there's meaning everywhere if your effort is total. So the question then becomes, yes, we should give our full effort to our reading because not only because our professors have asked us to do it, but because that's where the truth is. But those things also exist in other parts of our lives. Is your effort total when you listen in chapel? Is your effort total with your friends and your loved ones? Or do sometimes you blow people off or you don't have time for them? Is your effort total in your schoolwork? I know you all say you care about grades, but do you really? Is it meaningful for you, truly? That's only something you can answer. Have we found meaning through our faith? Have we given our full effort to our faith? I think those are the things that John Donne talks about and he struggles with in his poems. So ultimately, like I said at the beginning, I like John Donne because he kind of reflects a lot of the things that I went through as a younger person and still go through. There's all sorts of things I wonder about. Lots of things don't make sense. But as he says, the more you wrestle with it, the more faith you actually develop. It's okay to have doubts sometimes. It's the struggle and it's the pursuit of the truth that matters because God will find his way to you too.